All right, so good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because, for a few reasons, uh, all September long, we are showcasing marine plastics, and we've got a perfect speaker for that today. And it is also in Canada, Science Literacy Week. So over 650 events happening coast to coast for so for our Canadian classrooms. If you guys want to check out a lot of great events on science, and particularly oceans, all week long, you can find something near you at scienceliteracy.ca. So do check that out. Right now, we've got five classes joining us from across North America, and I want to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Mr. Douglas's grade 11 and 12s in Peterborough, Ontario. Hi, guys. <laughs> awesome. We've got Miss Lumley's grade five, sixes in Sarnia, Ontario. Hey, we've got uh, Miss Carton's grade five, six is in Anchorage in Alaska. Hey guys. Yeah. All right. Miss Hans's grade eights in Austin, Texas. Hi guys. Whoa. <laughs> One guy is like super excited. Um, and then we've got Mr. And Pleasure's grade nines in London, Ontario. We'll go introduce them later. Their class is just switching over, but thank you guys all for joining us. So of course we are joined live by our speaker, Alice or Alice Hoyland, uh, joining us from Dofino in BC. She is part of Surfrider Pacific Rim, which is a non-governmental organization that works to understand and work towards conserving and protecting marine areas. So they look at marine plastics. You know, what's the issue? How big an issue is it? And then what can we do to help stop it? So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alice. Thanks so much for joining us and take it away. Hello. Lovely, lovely, lovely to see you all. This is awesome. This is so exciting to be um, with you guys all over North America. Super, super stoked to be with you guys today. Yep. So my name is Alice. And uh, as Jesse said, I work with Surf Rider Pacific Rim um, and we're based out of Tofino, BC. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of where that is, um, just in case, let's have a look. So we got Vancouver Island right here on the west coast of Canada. And if we zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, you'll see this is where we are right here. So it's kind of nice to, to know where we are in the context of, of the world right here. So this is us. And you can actually see exactly where I am. That's exciting. <laughs> That's my house. That's where I am if you want to come visit. <laughs> so this is Tofino, BC. And zooming out, that's where we are in, uh, in, in terms of the world today, which is quite exciting. Um, and I'm here with you to share a little bit about what I do uh, for work, what I do for, for fun. And so without further ado, I'll, I'll hopefully get up on our slideshow here. Um, just give me one second. Whoop. Wants to work. It'll work. There it is. <laughs> You're good to go. This is a, a much a much better image than uh, than Google Maps can give you. Um, so this is Tofino, BC. This is a picture taken from Coxcone. It is one of the most beautiful places in the world, in my humble opinion. You might be able to tell from my accent, I'm not actually a Tofino native. I am from uh, the UK. So I did find it quite funny when Jesse said that uh, usually British speakers have a, a cup of tea. I'll have to bear that in mind for next time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm from I'm from Northern England, but I moved to Tofino three years ago and uh, I fell in love with this place because it is so beautiful. Look at that picture. Um, and the reason it's so beautiful is because it is, uh, it's kind of got a, an amazing history of environmental activism and also stewardship on behalf of uh, the First Nations here. So Tleokwiat First Nation, Howazit First Nation and Heskwet First Nation, the three nations that are, are based in Clackwet Sound here. Oh my goodness, sorry, having issues. That's okay. Um, and those nations have been stewarding in this area for literally since time immemorial. And also more recently um, in terms of our old growth forest and, and marine ecosystems, lots of people have been working to protect that for a really long time. So we're, we're living in, a, in an area that's got this amazing uh, history with environmental activism. And I'm stuck to share some of our more recent steps with you guys today. So a bit about me, this is me, <laughs> um, usually found elbow deep in uh, marine debris. This is me cleaning the beach uh, on Vargas Island in, in BC, uh, just close to Tofino. 
Um, and my everyday job, I'm actually a kayak guide. So I get to spend all day every day out in this amazing wilderness environment that I live in um, with sharing this space with amazing creatures and amazing people. Um, and I think it's being surrounded by environment all the time and being surrounded by these beautiful places that really encouraged me to, um, to, sorry about this, having some technical issues. There we go. Really encouraged me to get involved. So um, seeing marine debris on the beaches in these beautiful places is really something that will kind of um, push you to, to really get involved in these things. So that was my initial motivations. Um, and so that's when I started volunteering for Surf Rider Pacific Rim. And so <coughs> Surf Rider Foundation is actually an international organization. Um, we are based all over the world, but locally in the Pacific Rim, we have a um, specific focus to work on uh, eliminating single use plastics and trying to find more um, progressive ways of recycling hard to hard to recycle petroleum products like um did you know that cigarette butts for example are made out of plastic so they're actually a petroleum product so trying to find ways to recycle items like this and also working with young people businesses government individuals to create system change but more about all this later um <laughs> i might kind of uh switch off this for now because it keeps uh, it keeps doing crazy things so maybe i'll just talk to you guys um so my job at surf rider pacific rim is actually to um deliver this so this is the youth environmental stewardship program um and through this we're hoping to empower students and young people just like you guys to become leaders in their communities so that is the idea of the youth environmental stewardship program and um one of the main focuses for the youth environmental stewardship program is actually talking about ocean plastics so i'm sure that you guys have all seen lots of pictures of what happens to plastic when it gets into the marine environment so just to give you a, um, an indication of some of the work that we do with Surf Rider Pacific Rim, if it'll show me, uh, if it'll let me show you, um, I'd just like to show you some data that we collected from one of our last cleans. So one of the things that we do with Surf Rider, one of the things that we're most kind of well known for are our beach cleans. So this, oh my goodness, sorry guys. <laughs> Such technical issue. Uh, maybe I can show you just like this, actually. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so we're really well known for our beach cleans. We do, we do lots of beach cleans annually. And just some idea of what we did on our last beach clean, we cleaned the Broken Group Islands in Barclay Sound, uh, close to where I live. And this is just an example of some of the things, that, well, actually all the stuff that we found on this coastline. So we found more than half or almost half of what we found was actually foam. You can see we found 20 super sacks of foam. Um, but actually, aside from the foam and stuff from aquaculture, which is quite prevalent out here, the vast majority of stuff that we were finding on our beaches was actually post-consumer waste. So what I mean by that is we were finding um, plastic that people people are using, people like you and me. So plastic bottles, we found thousands, literally thousands of plastic bottles. Isn't that crazy? Um, and so I guess you could say that was our trash trend for our most recent remote cleanup in the, in the Broken Group Islands. Um, but one thing to bear in mind about beach cleans is that this doesn't actually get to the root of the issue. So we know that um, cleaning the beach is really great for giving us an idea of what we're finding there, but it doesn't actually stop the plastic from getting there in the first place. And so with Surf Rider Pacific Rim, what we do is we take that data that we collect on these beach cleans and we use it to inform our campaigns. So one of our campaigns and programs that we run, like I said, is the Youth Environmental Stewardship Program. Um, and hopefully that is, uh, is, is gonna inspire our youth to try and take a stand to prevent this plastic from getting there in the first place. So for example, um, our most recent clean found lots of plastic bottles. And now if those plastic bottles went into the marine environment, um, first of all, they'd start floating around on top, especially if they had uh, lids on. And so those plastic bottles, they get blown about by the wind, they get moved around by ocean currents and gyres, and they often collect in areas that we refer to as, as uh, sorry, as gyres, as currents, as gyres. So the, the 
Great Pacific garbage patch, you guys have probably heard of. There's been a lot of, of news about that. It's a huge area in the Northern Pacific where we get a big accumulation of debris, like these plastic bottles that we found on our beaches. So they get blown into the ocean, they get washed around in these gyres. However, they don't just stay on the surface. So just the surface is a very small percentage of the plastic that's actually in those gyres. So as the sun beats down on that plastic and as the currents move them around, they start to break down into smaller and smaller pieces and then they begin to sink. And so before you know it, you've got plastic on the top, but you also have a plastic soup dripping down into the bottom of the ocean and kind of moving around with these with these ocean currents. And that's when things start to get really quite problematic for animals. So in the Pacific Rim, we're really lucky that we share this amazing landscape with all kinds of animals, from whales to really small creatures. And these animals are interacting with this plastic that we're finding on our beaches and in our oceans. Uh, we know that I think it's about 50% of humpback whales that have been monitored out here actually have scars from entanglement from uh, discarded fishing gear and plastic that's left in our ocean. So just to give you an idea on that. So animals are interacting with this plastic um, and they're mistaking it for food. They're getting entangled in it and it is having a, a terrible effect on our local marine life. So that's definitely one of the things that motivates me in this job. Um, but I guess one of the most insidious kind of effects that plastic can have on marine life is actually through bioaccumulation. As my slides aren't working, I'm going to use my booklet. Um, you can see here we've got a, a diagram here of, of what bioaccumulation is. So as these plastics break down, they actually can attract uh, background pollutants in the ocean. And then as these uh, microplastics and background pollutants are being consumed by animals, on the first step of the food chain, you get, um, you get small microscopic animals like zooplankton that are absorbing these toxins. And then they get eaten by animals that are a little bit bigger, bottom feeders, um, maybe like herring, for example. Um, or, or forage, forage fish. And then these animals then get eaten by bigger animals like salmon, for example. Anyone else like to eat salmon? I know a lot of people do too. Um, so the, these animals are then eating this and this whole time they're eating more, right? So the salmon, they're not just gonna eat one um, forage fish, they're gonna eat lots. And so each step up, they're eating lots of the animal below and so each step up is getting more of these toxins that have accumulated um, through the, the pollutants that we're putting into the ocean. So by the time that you're hitting transient killer whales, they've got lots and lots of pollutants inside of them. And that's one of the reasons that our killer whales are in so much trouble right now is that their, their food is actually really toxic for them. So we know that plastics in the ocean is a bad thing. All of what I've been talking about here is just kind of giving you an idea of, of some of the terrible things that plastics in the ocean are doing. But what can we do about it? That's the real question, right? And so at Surf Rider Pacific Rim, we have a few ideas as to uh, what we can do. I'm going to just give it one last try to see if they're going to let me show you <laughs> my presentation here and we'll get back on track. Um, da, da, da. So yes, this is a sea otter that's very shocked at the, uh, the statistics of the amount of plastic that we're finding in the ocean. And here are some other examples of animals that are affected by that from our small bottom feeders like urchins all the way up to our transient killer whales there. Um, what can we do? So at Surf Rider Pacific Rim, we think there are lots of different ways of being a leader in your community and different leadership styles work for different people. So one of the really great ways that you can be a leader is to be an example. Think about the ways that you can reduce your own plastic consumption. So, for example, um, using a reusable um, coffee cup instead of taking a, a, a new disposable one every time you get a coffee the same with a water bottle. You can actually be a leader just by making those changes in your own life and other people will notice that, right? If you think about the lunch that you're bringing to school with you, um, making sure that your, your lunch box is, is zero waste or, or that you're not throwing away uh, plastic wrappers if you can. Another way of being a, a leader is to be a teacher. So think about the things that you've learned. Think about um, what you know about um, plastic pollution and teach other people about it. 
spread the word. And that doesn't have to be in a classroom environment. You can be a teacher in lots of different ways. How many of you guys use social media, um, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of those social medias that you use? That's a great way to be a teacher and share what you know and get other people, people uh, interested and in, involved in, and asking questions about marine debris. Um, another really great way that you can be a leader is to be an artist. So if you ever do um, a beach clean or if you do a green, green streets, if you go and uh, clean a, a litter pick in your, in your schoolyard or on your streets at home, you can use that debris to create artwork and to create um, visually striking images that get people involved and get people interested in a different way that is sometimes more interesting than uh, perhaps just, uh, just talking or, or writing. What Surf Rider Pacific RIM does, as well as all those things, is we also campaign. So that's one of the really big ways that we can make a, a big difference is by using all those different methods. So being a leader, by being a teacher, by being an artist, by a, inspiring, encouraging others, but also by using that support, using that community support um, that you generate through that to actually campaign and make change. And so, for example, Take, for example, the data that we got from our most recent clean. What we discovered was that actually there are thousands and thousands of clear plastic water bottles washing up on our shoreline. Now, when you bear in mind that that's just six kilometers of shoreline, and I guess, I think BC has got something like 26,000 kilometers of shoreline. And I know that Canada has almost got 250,000 kilometers of shoreline. So in six kilometers of shoreline, when you're finding thousands of plastic bottles, that tells you that plastic bottles are a little bit of an issue, right? And so using that data that we've collected on our beach clean, we might then decide to do a campaign on the back of that. We might decide that we want to really encourage people to stop using uh, disposable plastic water bottles. We might think about the kind of people that we need to get support from in order to get that through. So um, we think about the kind of people that are using plastic, plastic water bottles. We think about where people are getting plastic water bottles from. Maybe we could write a letter to our local grocery store asking them stopping, to stop selling small plastic water bottles. Perhaps we could talk to our local uh, schools, our head teachers working with schools. Sometimes students will talk to their teachers and ask them to stop selling plastic water bottles in vending machines, for example. These are all different ways of, uh, of having an impact, taking your small impact and magnifying it on a school level, on a community level. So plastic water bottles is definitely, uh, definitely one one takeaway from our, our, look, our last uh, cleanup. So once you've thought about who you're gonna, who, who support you're gonna get, you can think about different tactics that you're gonna get to get there. You might wanna create artwork, you might want to write letters, you might wanna create a social media campaign. There are all sorts of different ways of influencing people and getting other people on board. But the most important thing to do is actually take action. I think oftentimes, um, when we're getting all this news about um, pollution and about climate change and about all these issues that seem so big and really hard to tackle as an individual, it, it can feel quite, quite sad. It can make you quite upset to think about all these things that seem outside of your control. However, if you take action, no matter how small, you're having an influence and you're influencing those people around you. And the more people that you can influence, if you think about those key influences like your friends, your teachers, your your local government the bigger that ripple is going to be right so it's really important to to um to do what you can uh, the best that you can do it so let me see if i can get to my last slide here last push <laughs> So this is just a picture. This picture here is actually from uh, one of the events that we, we ran in conjunction with some other organizations in our local area. So this um, was a joint event. It's called Hands Across the Sand, and it actually happens globally. There might have been one in your local area. Um, and it's just encouraging local community members to come out and show solidarity with each other um, against um, specific issues so for us we got everybody involved on that day to come and sign a uh, sign a surfboard saying that they were um for motion 151 which is against um plastic well mitigating plastic pollution in the ocean um and we all ha held hands across the sand in a symbolic gesture 
Um, and I just wanted to share this uh, this quote with you guys. So never, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And that really is kind of the backbone of Surf Riders work here. We are a, we're an activist network. We're a, a network of volunteers, primarily people, small individual people working together to make big change. <laughs> so that's a, a little bit about me and, and what I do. Um, and I know that's a very brief impact, a brief kind of uh, summary of, of what we're doing at Surf Rider Pacific Rim. We've got lots of campaigns and programs going on, and I'm happy to answer questions on, on any of those things. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much, Alice. And uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's dive into questions, guys. We're going to start out with Miss Carton's class. If you guys want to kick us off with one, come on up. Anyone in Alaska? Oh, we got one class. <laughs> yeah, you guys are good. Hi, I'm Sai, and my question is how many dead fish and seagulls have you found, like washed up? That's a great question, Sai. So, um, I mean, on our individual cleans, we don't often find um, dead animals washed up on our monthly beach cleans. Um, however, we we do know that um, a lot of animals kind of get washed up after specific events. So, um, for example, if you have oil spills or whatever, that's when we usually find uh, most animals kind of washed up on shore. Uh, we do know that plastics are affecting animals, though. We often get... Um, so in Tofino, we, we're quite a big tourism town. And so there's lots of whale watching and bear watching and people going out on boats to look at animals. And oftentimes the skippers on those boats, they will actually take pictures and kind of send those pictures into researchers. And a lot of those pictures have images of animals that have um, kind of entanglement scars or sometimes there will be images of sea lions that have got plastic around their necks and things. So I don't have any... Um, any numbers off the top of my head, but we definitely, well, the number that I do have off the top of my head is that 50% of humpback whales that are studied have entanglement scarring on them. So we do know that plastic debris is definitely having a, an effect on animals local to here as well. Yeah. Excellent question, guys. I also want to know we've got a few groups watching on YouTube live as well. So if you guys want to type in questions there, I'll happily pass them along to Alice. Uh, <laughs> but let's dive in with a second question with Miss Hans's class. If you guys want to come up, go for it. James Quinton, how much plastic do you generally find in towns or kilograms? Sometimes or two. So, uh, Alice, it's how many pounds of plastic do you typically find, or pounds or kilograms of plastic do you find when you do one of these cleanups? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, on our, I've got this, the data for our last beach clean right uh, in front of me here, actually. So that's a good question um i know off the top of my head that on our last cleanup at the broken group islands we found 45 cubic meters of um debris and about 20 of those cubic meters was foam um so let's have a look yeah that was the equivalent of 14 cars worth of debris so it's an interesting question about weight. We do we do take weights of uh, of the the debris that we find, uh, but when you consider how much foam we find, do you think that the weight of foam sounds very impressive? No. Not at all. <laughs> styrofoam is very very light, and we find a lot of styrofoam. So the reason that we find a lot of styrofoam on our beaches is that we have a lot of shipping containers and a lot of aquaculture, a lot of docks that are often use uh, styrofoam to float. And so um, what, we try, what we're trying to move towards is getting um, volume measurements for our, for our beach cleans. But it, it's a really, important Quentin, a really important question, Quentin, because data from beach cleans is the most important aspect. It's every time you do a beach clean, every time you do a clean up, it's so important to get data because it's that that really gives us an idea of what's in the ocean and what's getting into the, the natural environment. Um, so yeah, from our last cleanup, just to answer your question, it was the equivalent of 14 cars, if you can imagine 14 cars worth of debris. Um, and if you wanted more specifics, let's have a look. Um, we found, so it was a 1,128 clear plastic bottles. 
um, 314 buoys, 35 barrels, and the wow. total weight for that was 3.5 tons, 3.5 tons of debris. Wow. A, a great answer, terrible answer, but great in, in the sense that, yeah, <laughs> that's too bad. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Douglas's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. There we go. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah. Uh, we are, I was just wondering, uh, what do you do with the plastics that you collect? So I know you, like you said, you make um, artwork out of some of it, but what else do you do with it? Fantastic question, Sarah. So in um, where we are here, we're really lucky to have this amazing partnership with an organization called Ocean Legacy. Now they're based out of Vancouver and they actually take a lot of our marine debris. Um, so what these guys do, they have different ways of processing that marine debris to do different things. They're making fuel out of it. They're but they, they recycle all of it, which is incredible. So um, again, just taking our last clean as an example, um, I think it was, let me find the exact number so I can tell you guys. So only 20 pounds of that 3.5 tons was actually landfilled. Because obviously what we're looking for here is we're looking for alternative solutions, right? It's no good like cleaning the beach and then sending everything to landfill because the chances are that it could escape into the national environment again. And essentially you're stopping. It's kind of the lesser of two evils sometimes when you're thinking about what we're going to do with this debris. Um, you know, we're, is it going to poison the marine environment? Is it going to poison the terrestrial environment? So at Surf Rider Pacific Rim, we're, we're always looking for ways to recycle as much as possible. And so this is what a lot of our programs are, are focused towards as well. So finding end of life solutions for things so they don't end up in landfall, so they don't end up in the ocean. So, for example, um, finding ways to recycle, hard to recycle items like wetsuits or cigarette butts or pens, you know, working with TerraCycle and with Ocean Legacy to find end of life solutions. And hopefully, you know, ultimately the goal is to try and work with producers to when we're creating things to create items in a way that makes them um, easier to recycle in a, in a biological sense or in a technological sense. Outstanding. Uh, so I want to go to our classes. We've mentioned a lot of organizations today. We're going to pass along a list of all these groups so you can check out more in, in all elements of marine plastics and cleanups and everything else uh, at the end of the session. We're also going to, I, I just want to highlight, we've done a couple hangouts with a group called Burio. So they make uh, skateboards and sunglasses and other stuff out of marine plastic pollution, which is super cool. And as for art, washed ashore. So this is like a traveling exhibit going across Canada and the States uh, made by the Smithsonian. And so it's these beautiful sculptures that are made of trash entirely taken from the Pacific. So if you want like the, the gold standard of how that can look at its absolute best, I just encourage you to check that out. Amazing. Uh, I want to pass along a quick uh, mention from a group online. So Miss Waterton's class, London in that class, just wanted to mention that she did the Great Canadian Shoreline cleanup in their town. Uh, they found a ton of cigarette uh, butts and a big plastic tote. And so I want to just mention, you've mentioned shoreline cleanups a lot. Um, I don't know if you can speak to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup as a specific thing, but it's a fantastic project if you can tell us a little more about it. Absolutely. So um, and my, my knowledge of the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is, is not super in-depth. I know that we record all of our data that we, we collect on our beach cleans gets recorded to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, and so this is another question about data, right? So we keep talking about how important it is to get data. Um, with this data that we collect from our shoreline cleanups, we're able to then use that to leverage um, decision makers, right? So we talked about how you can create impact here and then ripple that out on an individual, your friends, your school, your community. If you think about the people that have the biggest ripple impact, it's definitely our elected members, you know, locally, provincially, federally, <coughs> excuse me, who have the capacity to make change on a, on a national level, right? And so with the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup and these other agencies that collect data from cleanups, we can use that to paint a picture of what the state of our oceans are right now, um, to also to paint a picture of how our recycling systems and how our current um, systems for getting rid of our debris and our 
our waste is broken, right? So when we're finding lots of plastic on the beaches, this is indicating that we need to do something about our systems on a national level. And so the Great Canadian, Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup um, is a great way of collating data basically so that we can then say, look, this is what we found nationally. And um, Mr. Prime Minister, we need to do something about this. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, Ms. Lumley's class, I you guys are in a little trouble hearing for whatever reason, and I'm very sorry for that, but hopefully you have a question for us if you want to come in and uh, go for it about marine plastics. <coughs> hey guys, yeah, you, we should be able to hear you, Ms. Lumley's class. Maybe. Maybe it's tech difficulties generally. Okay, so I've got you guys muted again. Um, oh. How about now? Let's try one more time. Sorry, and then we'll check in with another class if we can't get it working. No. Ooh, maybe. Yep, you're good. It's Lumley. Okay. If it's not working, there's a little chat bar in the bottom right of the screen, or you can email me, um, and we'll pass along the questions from there. So let's go to Mr. Trent Pleasure's class. You guys have a question. You guys have a question. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, we have a question. Um, but yeah, we won't be able to hear you as long as you have that other one on. Sorry, guys. So, okay, we're going to go to the sixth class. So, Miss Sharp's class, if you guys have a question, they joined us a little bit later. So, these are grade nines and tens from Parma and Michigan. Do you guys want to come up? Go for it. Hello, thanks hey, for having hey, us and letting hey, us come hey. in a little late. We appreciate, this is Aiden. Aiden's gonna ask. Oh, yes, I we, forgot my question. He's, he forgot his question <laughs> asked us, but he's coming. Come back. So thank you, you so much back. for having us, um, us coming in late. Lily, why did you decide to follow this career? Say it one more time slower. Oh, Lily, why did you decide to follow this career? Alice, go for it. And, oh. Uh, and for sure. Um, <laughs> did you guys think I was Lily? <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. Sorry for that confusion. I'm, that's I'm my, that's my fault. I, I told them the wrong name and didn't correct them when we came back. So I'm sorry. <laughs> that's totally fine. So li Lily is our chat manager for okay, I'm Alice. I'm Alice Hoyland. Um, so um, I guess this career kind of just happened to me is the honest answer i uh i kind of i ended up in tofino bc and i was having an amazing time kayak guiding out here so kayak guiding is is, is what i do for a living um and when i was paddling around in this amazing area and learning more about you know the the history of this place and the 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 history of environmental activism in this place specifically which is the reason why it's so beautiful you know the reason why we have this amazing environment here is because people fought to protect it um and i guess been involved in that and also living in a small town with limit, limited infrastructure it really kind of paints a picture of the the issues that we have with our current systems regarding kind of waste management and also um uh, and also just kind of the way that our systems are designed. And so this kind of led me into being more involved on a volunteer basis with Surf Rider Pacific Rim and then bringing my background as a, as a youth worker and educator to, to that side of the, the program in here. So I guess that's how I ended up in this job, but it, it, it's just marrying all of my passions for being outside and also uh, uh, working with young people. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right, the question from Ms. Tran Pleasure's class, they wanted to know who funds your programming. This is something we're getting a lot actually with programs like this is like who supports programs like this to enable them to happen? Absolutely, yeah. So we are a, a not-for-profit organization, which means that a lot of our funding actually comes from grants from various places. So we write grant applications from, um, uh, from local government, from all kinds of different uh, foundations and organizations. We do have um, kind of requirements for places that we seek funding from as well so um it's it's a it's a tricky one you know navigating that field of what money is acceptable to to take and what isn't um usually with surf rider pacific rim um one of our, our main kind of things that we we look towards is, is working with polluters to help them change but not necessarily accepting money from polluters um we 
we don't want to ever um, be accused of allowing polluters to greenwash right so we want to support polluters to change their practices but we don't want to just accept money and, and not have that relationship so funding uh, it comes from either individual donations we also are a membership organization so you can become a member of surf rider and that money comes towards uh, to funding our campaigns and programs as well but a lot of our money actually comes from grants perfect all right so let's dive through a second round of questions guys we got plenty of time so miss trim pleasures class miss lumley's class if you guys want to type in more please do but start again with miss curtin's group if you guys want to come up again go for it all right and this will be our last, we are going to have to disconnect here in just a couple of minutes. So thank you for taking our last question. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Molly. About how much trash do you guys pick up a year? How much do we pick up a year? Um, let me tell you exactly. That'll be good, hey? Um, I know that last year, or was the year before, it was close to 20 tons. Um, I'm not sure if you heard before, there was uh, a question around about this um and it's kind of a tricky one to tell you in a way that's any it's, it's tricky to give you meaningful data on weight because so much of what we find is foam and so uh foam doesn't weigh very much <laughs> um and so um what we what we've discovered a, a more kind of meaningful way of collecting data on we've, what we find on our shoreline cleanups is to kind of keep track of individual items and also volume. So um, we find a lot of foam by volume. Um, we find a lot of hard plastics, and specifically we find a lot of post-consumer plastics as well. So things like plastic water bottles, uh, plastic cutlery. Um, plastic coffee lids, uh, bottle tops, packaging, food packaging. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of the debris that we find that can't be recycled is, is usually so soft plastics that are super degraded and can't be recycled there. So food packaging is a huge part of, of what we're finding on our, on our shorelines here. Um, all the data from all of our cleans, by the way, you can actually find on our website as well. So if you're interested in specific clean data, if you go to pacificrim.surfrider.org, um, you can find the data from all of our cleans online as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Alice. So I did lie when I said we're going to do a second round of questions. I'm getting a lot of notes from teachers like it's the end of the period, so I don't want you to all disappear. So before we wrap up then, Alice, is there one last message you want to share with classes, something that they can do to learn more, something they can do right now today to help out with, with this issue? Totally, yeah. So I guess um, from from our perspective at Surf Rider Pacific Rim and our, our youth programming, um, the number one thing that you can do is really think about what you can do as an individual and then share that right so share 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 and influence 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 within your within your group kind of get involved get uh, excited about what excites you and share that with other people um so remember that you don't have to solve all the problems at once if you can find one issue that you're passionate about one issue that means something to you work on that and share that with other people um, and definitely don't feel like you have to solve the world's problems by yourself because there's a, a big network of activists all working with you. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you so, so much, Alice, for joining us today. It's such a thrill having you as part of our entire month dedicated to marine plastics. So as I said, we're going to pass along a bunch of resources to all the classes at the end. What we do at the end of every Hangout, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So Ms. Sharp's class, Mr. Douglas's class, Ms. Lumley's class, Ms. Curtin, everyone, if you guys could join me in just saying a huge thank you uh, to Alice for joining us today. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Guys. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Uh, we hope to have you all back soon and have a wonderful rest of your day. Look for those things soon. And thanks for joining us, guys.